inside of Lars' clothes. Rats. So are we live? Okay, wonderful. Welcome, everybody. It's so good to see you this evening for everybody who's in person. Uh, we are also live streaming this. So we had um, 82 people, I think, signed up who are taking this virtually tonight. So I'm sorry you're not with us. We're having fun, but we're glad that you're all joining us. It's so good to see your faces again. It really is. It's fabulous. Well, I know a lot of you have uh, been watching these series for years. And by the way, I'm so sorry. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nancy Easterling, and I am the executive director. It is my honor to serve here. Um, this has been a series for us since 2008, and it has been incredible, the number of speakers, the wonderful people that we have had to come and share their stories with us. The gentleman we have tonight was uh, first spotted by Jeannie Pearl, who I believe Jeannie, our former Director of Educational Programming and Partnerships, who's on tonight. She and Catherine Humphreys saw him up in Annapolis and said, we have got to get him here. This is the fourth time we have had him as a speaker. You are that good, my friend. <laughs> Started with uh, remixing Hamilton. And then we had him back for talking about Ben Franklin. And then last year, Juneteenth. But this is the book that we first heard him, uh, had heard that he had written and really wanted to have him join us for. So let me give you a little bit of his bio. Um, his CV, by the way, is like 
22 pages long. This man is incredible. You're way too young to have a CV that long, my friend. I'm a very, he's very tight and he's got kids. So yeah, there's that. So let me give you a little bit of background on the incredible man that we are so happy to have here tonight. Richard Bell received his PhD from Harvard University and his BA from the University of Cambridge. His research interests focus on American history between 1750 and 1877. His most recent book was the one we're going to hear about tonight, Stolen, Five Free Boys Kidnapped into Slavery and Their astonish Astonishing Odyssey Home. And it was a recipient of the NEH Public Scholar Award, and a, he was a finalist for the George Washington Prize and the Harriet Tubman Prize. He's published two other books, We Shall Be No More, Suicide and Self-Government in the Newly United States, and Buried Lives Incarcerated in Early America. He is also the author of a dozen book chapters and journal articles, and way more. This man has written so much, you must not sleep. He is presently an Andrew Carnegie Fellow and has held research fellowships as, at more than two dozen libraries and institutes. Since coming to College Park in 2006, he has served as a Mellon Fellow in American History at Cambridge University, the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow at the American Antiquitarian Society, a Mayor Fellow at the Huntington Library, a Research Fellow at the Gilder Lehman Lehrman, I can never say that correctly, Center for the Study of Slavery, Abolition and Resistance at Yale University, and as a resident fellow at the John, J., John W. Klug at the Library of Congress. He is also a frequent lecturer at C-SPAN Television Network and the Smithsonian Institute. He's a recipient of more than a dozen teaching awards, including the University System of Maryland Board of Regents Faculty Award for Excellence in Teaching the highest honor for teaching faculty in the Maryland state system. He's also one of the conveners of the Washington Area Early American Seminar, a member of the Board of Trustees for the Maryland Center of History and Culture, an elected member of the Massachusetts Historical Society and the Colonial Society of Massachusetts, and a fellow for the Royal Historical Society. On campus, he serves as chair for the University of Maryland United Kingdom Fellowships Committee, and is a member of the 1856 Project. He lives in University Park, Maryland, has a wife and two daughters, and does not sleep. I know you do not. We are so thrilled to finally have you here after three years. Let's give it up, guys, for Richard Bell. Um, wow, thank you. She read the whole thing. Um, there's nothing left. I don't do anything else. Um, thank you. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here. I've lived in the state of Maryland, the great state of Maryland, uh, since 2007, despite not being originally from Maryland, as you've probably figured uh, out. I'm originally from London. Um, and I think in my, what, 16, 17 years of living in the great state of Maryland, this is my first time in southern Maryland. So thank you, Nancy, for this invitation. What a gorgeous part of the world you guys get to live uh, in. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. In fact, um, uh, when we were setting up uh, for tech earlier on, I, uh, I stood at the back of the room and I took a picture on my camera facing down here as we'd set all this up and texted it to my wife. And she texted back saying, lovely, are you presiding over a wedding ceremony? <laughs> so if any two of you would like to step forward at this point, not you, uh, not everyone. Right? Um, uh, this is a lovely space. I'm really grateful for this uh, op opportunity uh, here. And I also more seriously want to say that, you know, the work that's being done at uh, Sotoli is some, uh, or when it comes to racial equity, when it comes to reckoning with America's past, uh, Maryland's past, this region's past, uh, is what we in public history would call exemplary work. This place is um, a model, a paragon of the way you can do important, truthful work in sensitive, inclusive uh, ways. For folks watching online, if you've not been down here recently, come down and check what, what these folks uh, are doing. This is a model for other institutions around the country wrestling with some of these exact same uh, histories. So uh, uh, long may it continue. Here, here. Yes, here, here. 
So it's with that in mind that I'm going to pivot to, of course, the very serious subject, uh, I think important subject that we're going to talk about uh, today. There are definitely no jokes ahead in the next 45 or 50 uh, minutes uh, or so. Um, though there is unusually an interactive element. Uh, I will stop at one point in this talk, um, which is aimed at people who have not yet read this book, um, and ask you a question. And I'd encourage, especially folks in the room, uh, to raise their hands and chip in. And if there are folks online who want to contribute to that interactive element, then we'll do our best to incorporate uh, your contributions as well. And certainly when we get to q and I want to hear from folks online and folks in the room as well. All right, let's get um, going, folks. Cornelius Sinclair was 10 years old, and he was trapped. He was stuck. He was locked in the belly of a small ship that looked a bit like the one on the screen here that was bobbing in the middle of the Delaware River, a mile south of Philadelphia. A man had grabbed this 10-year-old kid from a spot near Philadelphia's market an hour ago, shoved a gag into the kid's mouth, tossed him into a wagon, and hauled him here. It was, of course, dark below the waterline, but 10-year-old Cornelius could see enough to know that he was not the only child locked down there. Four pairs of eyes stared back at him, four other African-American boys. One looked about his size. He was probably 10 or 11 years old, like Cornelius. Two more were taller, perhaps 14 or 15 years old. The last of them was shorter and much smaller than everyone else. He might have been as young as eight years old. Yesterday, all five boys had been free, like you and me. But today they were enslaved. Today they were prisoners of a gang of child snatchers who planned to sell their lives and labor, most likely to plantation owners in the deep, deep south. If their abductors got away with this, Cornelius would spend the rest of his life as someone else's property, somewhere very far away. He would probably never see his family again. Cornelius disappeared in late August of 1825. He was one of dozens of African-American children to vanish in very similar circumstances from Philadelphia that single year alone. In the early 1800s, the city of Philadelphia was the hub of American slavery's blackest market. Philadelphia's gridded streets and tangled alleys were hunting grounds for crews of professional kidnappers who made their livings turning free black kids like Cornelius Sinclair into southern slaves. And those kidnappers did their work swiftly and shamelessly in brazen affront to Philadelphia's reputation at the time, not only as the city of brotherly love, but also as a safe haven for people of color and as the headquarters of the American anti-slavery movement of that era. But to criminals, of course, to kidnappers, none of that stuff mattered. And in truth, early 19th century Philadelphia was probably one of the most dangerous places to be free and to be black anywhere in the United States. And this was a product of its location, of course. I know no one in this region needs a giant map with an arrow pointing to Philadelphia, but still, I'm a professor. I'm going to use crutches whenever I can. Um, Philadelphia was the nearest major free city on the East Coast to the slave South. Philadelphia lay just 40 miles north of the Mason-Dixon line, the boundary that separated Pennsylvania from several slave states to its south, including, of course, Maryland, where all of us are standing now. As Pennsylvania and other northern states had slowly disentangled themselves from race slavery, in the 50 or so years after the American Revolution, that 
boundary along Pennsylvania's southern border had become ever more important, especially for black folk. By 1825, the year that Cornelius was kidnapped, the Mason-Dixon line seemed to divide two worlds, separating northern free soil states like Pennsylvania from southern slave states like Maryland. And Philadelphia's proximity to that frontier line made its many free black residents very attractive targets for professional people snatchers pushing in from nearby slave states like Maryland and Delaware. And they would prey on members of that city's free black community relentlessly, putting bullseyes on their backs, putting prices on their heads. And the people they stole away from freedom could fetch anywhere up to $15,000 per person in today's money when sold in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, three of new territories and states rapidly rising up along the Gulf Coast at exactly this time. The American settlers swarming into that region demanded a nearly bottomless supply of forced labor to cut their sugar cane, to pick their cotton, and they would take almost anyone to do that entirely unpaid work. By a small percentage of their coerced black laborers from kidnappers of free black Americans was perhaps not their first choice. But their options were restricted at the time. Planters down in the Deep South had been forced to look to American sources for their manpower needs ever since the year 1808. 1808 was the year that lawmakers in Washington, D.C. had passed legislation outlawing any further imports of black people from Africa or the Caribbean for the purposes of enslaving them here in the United States. The federal government cuts off the legal supply of the Atlantic slave trade in 1808. That 1808 decision, by the way, not hugely famous unless you're literally a professional historian, but nonetheless an important date in the history of American slavery. You might call it a major turning point in the history of slavery in America, because that decision would spur the growth of a replacement slave trade. It would spur the growth of a domestic slave trade, an American slave trade, an internal slave trade within the United States. After that 1808 decision, interstate slave traders here in the United States tried to satisfy these southwestern settlers' demand for black labor by bringing them thousands of American-born enslaved people each year from existing slave states like Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia, where there were planters willing to sell some of their labor force for big profits to interstate traffickers. What I'm describing there is entirely legal. It's entirely legal for an enslaver in Maryland to decide to sell one, two, 30 of their laborers to an interstate slave trader who can carry them across the country, jack up the resale price, and sell these individuals in Mississippi, Alabama, um, uh, Louisiana. That's the domestic slave trade. It's entirely legal. Um, it will be responsible for the interstate trading of one million black Americans from our region down to that other region. And it was big business, all legal. But settlers down in the Deep South wanted even more than that. And the stronger their demand, the more tempting, the more profitable it became for anyone sufficiently cold-blooded to try to kidnap free children like Cornelius from northern cities like Philadelphia, launder them into that legal supply chain I just described, and then sell them all in this vast new southwestern slave market. These economic incentives left Philadelphia's large and dynamic free black community dangerously exposed. By 1825, the city of brotherly love had become the center of a nationwide kidnapping 
operation. It had become the northern point of origin of something I call America's reverse underground railroad. I'll use that phrase a lot this evening, America's reverse underground railroad. Every time I do, I'm referring to what I just described, which is the kidnapping of free black Americans from northern cities like Philadelphia for the purposes of trafficking them into southern slavery and selling them in the Deep South. And this reverse Underground Railroad, and its much better known namesake, the Underground Railroad, they of course ran in opposite directions, right? And they existed for completely different purposes. But because they're opposites, they're also sort of mirror images of each other. On the Underground Railroad, the good one, the famous one, the Harriet Tubman one, Enslaved people would abandon southern uh, slave labor camps and trek northward, dreaming of new lives and new opportunities in freedom. On America's reverse underground railroad, free black people were stolen from northern cities like Philadelphia and made to trudge southward to be sold into plantation slavery. On the Underground Railroad, conductors like Harriet Tubman risked their own lives and their own liberty to help black fugitives make these epic journeys of freedom. On America's reverse Underground Railroad, the conductors were kidnappers and human traffickers motivated only by money. Both of these networks, one obviously heroic and courageous, the other monstrously evil. Both of these networks roared to life in the early 1800s to exploit what by then had become major differences in the legal status of slavery in the North versus the South. Both networks were loosely organized and highly opportunistic. Both ran on secrecy. Both relied on small circles of trusted participants on um, forged documents and false identities and disguise. The direction of travel was usually completely different, but the routes from A to B or B to A, the routes taken by freedom seekers going north and victims of kidnapping made to go south, the routes were largely the same and they might even have passed one another on certain roads from time to time. And what's more, the volume of traffic, the number of people on these two metaphorical railroads was also roughly the same size. Each year, each one carried hundreds of adults across state lines. Half were surging towards freedom. Half were being dragged into slavery. I think many historians, I'll start that again, I think many Americans know quite a lot about the Underground Railroad by now, especially you all folks uh, uh, here, thanks to the efforts of the uh, um, uh, um, professionals here. Historians have spent decades studying the strategies and the tactics that American heroes like Harriet Tubman uh, and her fellow conductors and station agents used to help freedom seekers liberate themselves. The achievements of folks like Tubman now command our attention, which is wonderful, and there are Underground Railroad walking tours and television shows and museums. There was a movie, a TV series, maybe you've seen one or both. All of this stuff dedicated to celebrating the exceptional men and women who created the secret network through which the enslaved could escape to freedom, the Underground Railroad. I think we know far less about America's reverse underground railroad. Its conductors, its station agents worked tirelessly to remain untouchable. And the identities of all but a handful of these criminals still remain a secret even today in 2023. They certainly never gave public lectures about their work, as some conductors on the real Underground Railroad actually did. They never went on fundraising tours. Only rarely do their names and crimes even appear in police files or trial transcripts. Their low profile in surviving legal records 
is, of course, the result of the years they spent in the shadows, protected by bribes, protected by corruption, protected by too much indifference and apathy among ordinary Americans who knew what they were doing and did nothing to stop it. Unlike legal interstate slave traders, who sometimes donated their business records to southern colleges and historical societies, the criminal outlaws who built America's reverse underground railroad usually left no business records or bundles of private letters for historians to discover in the Library of Congress and read in that beautiful reading room. Kidnappers don't generally write memoirs. Kidnappers don't generally pose for paintings or photographs, which of course left journalists and activists of their era simply to guess, as you see here, as to what they might have looked like. No kidnapper posed for this image, right? But as I argue in my recent book, Stolen, these professional kidnappers nonetheless left their mark everywhere on 19th century America. If we think not just about Philadelphia, where the true story I tell in the book begins, but about almost every town or city with a free black population, that would include Baltimore, by the way, we think not just about 1825, when this true story begins, but about each and every year between 1808 and the Civil War, we can say with depressing certainty that all told, the kidnappers who built America's reverse Underground Railroad stole away from liberty likely tens of thousands of free black people, many of them children like Cornelius who were under the age of 16. And let me be crystal clear here, most of those they kidnapped from liberty were never heard from again. Their families and friends searched for them frantically. They lobbied, they petitioned, they advertised, they did anything they could think of. They waited in earnest for any sort of news, but usually nothing and no one came back. Free black people in cities like Philadelphia and Baltimore had very few white allies in this period of American history beyond the meager ranks of a handful of Quaker-led anti-slavery societies, but they're pitifully small. What's more, white employers openly discriminated against African-American job applicants. And city constables generally ignored people of color's complaints and turned a blind eye to most white on black street violence. So when kids like Cornelius went missing, their parents could hardly ever persuade mayors or magistrates or policemen to get involved, to do something, to do anything. It was rarer still for anyone to be able to gather enough evidence to issue arrest warrants, search property, and interrogate suspects. And even then, experienced members of these many Different kidnapping crews knew exactly what to do, exactly what to say, to talk their way out of trouble and to get back to work. For folks in the room, let's do a very quick show of hands. Raise your hand if you've heard of 12 Years a Slave. Pretty much everyone, right? Terrific. Um, and for folks who haven't, of course, 12 Years a Slave, it was the name of a movie. Uh, it won Best Picture in 2013. Uh, it's based on a memoir written by a guy named Solomon Northup. He was, of course, one of the tens of thousands of victims of America's reverse underground railroad. However, unlike almost everyone else, Northup later escaped his enslavement. Here's an actual quiz question for you. How many years did it take the author of 12 Years a Slave to escape slavery? This is not a trick question. Three people said the correct answer, 12. The correct answer is 12. It's in the name of the book. 
I once asked, uh, I was giving a version of this talk once uh, to um, a very different audience, and one of the people on the front row was the um, um, US ambassador to Great Britain. And I asked that exact question, and I didn't do it to anyone, anyone in the audience. I said, sir, how many years did it take him, Mr. Ambassador? And Mr. Ambassador just stared at me. He had no idea. So, <laughs> 12 years, 12 years. Um, that's remarkable that he escaped at all, but notice how long it took him to escape. Uh, but he escaped, he returned home, and then he wrote about it all in that memoir, 12 Years a Slave. Uh, he wrote that in 1853, and in that extraordinary book, if you haven't read it, go read it, Northup explains what riding America's reverse underground railroad was like for him. He explains how a pair of well-dressed white con men lured him into New York City from Northup's home in upstate New York in 1841. And at the time, Northup was a well-educated, prosperous musician in his mid-30s. In Manhattan, they wined and dined him. And if you've seen the movie, you remember they drugged him too. And then they sold him to an interstate slave trader in Washington, D.C. Northup was soon forced onto a slave ship that was bound for New Orleans. And there he was sold in one of that city's infamous slave showrooms to a planter, an enslaver, who put him to work in his sugarcane fields. That was Benedict Cumberbatch in the movie. In 2013, that Oscar-winning film, which every American should see, um, drew overdue attention to Solomon Northup's ordeal. Yet both the memoir and the movie offer misleading views of the people whom the agents of America's reverse underground railroad usually targeted and how those agents usually made their money. It turns out that Solomon Northup's experience on America's reverse underground railroad was not at all typical of everyone else's. The railroad's kidnappers rarely approached highly literate middle-aged men as Northup was. No, they preferred instead to lure away poorly educated street kids with tricks that could swiftly separate them from their families, from their loved ones. Very few of their captives traveled by ship to New Orleans either. Instead, kidnappers forced most boys and girls to trek southward on foot in small specialized walking convoys over land known as coffles, C-O-F-F-L-E, after the Arabic word for caravan. And their prisoners rarely ended up in showrooms or on the auction block either. Their prisoners were vastly more likely to be sold off in ones and twos somewhere along the way, usually in furtive all-cash deals to um, planters in the interior of Mississippi or the interior of Alabama, to men who wanted to buy more human beings as property but who were too cheap to pay big city New Orleans slave prices. All of that was what was typical. And all of that is almost exactly what happened to Cornelius Sinclair, one of the five central figures in my recent book. In August of 1825, Cornelius and Sam and Enos and Alex and Joe fell into the hands of 19th century America's most fearsome gang of professional kidnappers. And their captors hustled them onto a ship just outside Philadelphia, which of course is in the top right-hand corner of this map. Their captors warehoused them for a week or two in a pair of safe houses down on the Delaware-Maryland line. If you can see this black dot above the word Nanticote, that's exactly where the safe houses were, right on the line there. And then they marched them halfway across this vast continent toward the Deep South. 
where they tried to sell all five free children as slaves. This was a soul-destroying journey. If you're a child, by the way, it's a journey of two million footsteps, one after the other. In the book, as some of you know who've read the book, I have a lot to say about what that journey was like, but in the interest of time tonight, I'm going to skip over that journey in my remarks here. Uh, And um, likewise, the publisher always insists that I pass over much of my book's second half, in which readers learn that some, though sadly not all, of these five boys make a miraculous, odds-defying escape from all this and begin the astonishing odyssey home referred to in the book's subtitle. All I'm really allowed to say here is that Cornelius Um, is that what Cornelius and Sam and Enos and Alex and Joe made happen over the next two years was indeed astonishing to them and to me today. It would involve two murders, three exhumations of dead bodies from the grave, an escape, a recapture, a suicide, a race riot, a lawsuit, the nation's first most wanted list, and America's largest manhunt thus far. The gang that stole Cornelius was led uh, for much of its history by two white men whose names were Jesse Cannon and Joseph Johnson. It was their habit, oh, there my slides are behind me, there we go, It was their habit to warehouse most children they kidnapped from Philadelphia in the attics of their own houses, which, as I said, were out on the Maryland-Delaware line, which is a remote and underpopulated corner of the Delmarva Peninsula. Even today, I would describe it as remote and underpopulated. And they would keep these kids captive right there for days, sometimes weeks at a time, for however long it took them to organize the children's onward journey across the country and into the Deep South, where they could be sold as slaves. There are lots of unanswered questions about the reverse Underground Railroad in general, and plenty of questions in particular about how gangs like this one, the Cannon Johnson gang, how they used private homes as prisons, how they prevented kids warehoused inside them from escaping, why neighbors failed to sound the alarm, and why law enforcement in the region never successfully raided these properties. I highlight this because one of the breakthroughs I had in the course of my research for the book was a day back almost exactly 10 years ago in 2013 when I first came across a letter written to the officers of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society by their own chief investigator in the year 1819. I think that letter shed some light on some of the questions I just threw out. So for the next two or three minutes, I'm going to tell you, using a mixture of direct quotation and my own words, what that letter said. And then when I'm done, I'm going to ask you, literally, I'm going to ask you what that all reveals about how this particular gang of kidnappers and human traffickers operated, and fundamentally how they, how they got away with it all for so long. So listen carefully, and then we'll talk briefly afterwards. It's May 1819, so six years before Cornelius and the other four boys vanished from the streets of Philadelphia. In May of 1819, Sarah Hagerman, a free black girl aged 11, disappeared from her job near the waterworks just outside Philly. After her widowed mother made a public appeal for information, tip-off led to the arrest of Sarah's employer, a white woman named Margaret Ward. But Margaret Ward's trial that October for kidnapping, Margaret Ward confessed that, she, yes, she had, sold, she had kidnapped Sarah and sold her to a stolen goods dealer 
who had then sold the girl on to Jesse Cannon out on Maryland's eastern shore. Two weeks after that news broke in early November, the Pennsylvania Abolition Society dispatched John Willits to Maryland's eastern shore to try to find her and rescue her and bring her home. John Willits, who was white, was a dogged and experienced private detective. He arrived in Denton, Maryland on November the 13th. With him was a man named Miller, who knew young Sarah Hageman from Philadelphia and who hoped to identify this child by a scar she had on her forehead and another scar she had on one of her knees. But the pair of them ran into trouble almost immediately. The sheriff in Denton informed them that the man they were looking for, this Jesse Cannon, actually lived beyond the sheriff's jurisdiction, just across the state line in Sussex County, Delaware. It took Detective Willits another full day to track down a Delaware judge willing to issue a warrant to search Jesse Cannon's house, and then a second day to persuade a Delaware constable to actually execute the judge's order. And that officer in question, a young constable named Robeson, was none too keen to do so. Robeson had heard that Joseph Johnson, Jesse Cannon's partner, and also his son-in-law, had holed up in the same house as Jesse Cannon, and that both of these notorious kidnappers were likely to be armed and dangerous when they arrived. The private eye, the family friend, and the reluctant local constable arrived at Jesse Cannon's house on horseback um, on November the 15th as the day was turning to dusk. Peering through its back door, Willits saw three or four small black girls inside, though none seemed to match Sarah's description. Miller, the family friend, was a few paces behind. He thought he caught a glimpse of Sarah disappearing through the house's back garden and into the woods with some men. But before Miller could follow her, Joseph Johnson suddenly darted from behind a corner of the house and presenting a pistol to Mr. Miller's head, swore that if he attempted to advance another step, he would blow his brains out. Johnson demanded to know their business. What are you doing here? What do you want? Without dropping his weapon, he peered at the search warrant that the private eye had in hand, but declared this warrant, which was dated to be null and void because, he said, the sun was set, so the day is over. And he swore to shoot the first man who should attempt to raise a latch on any door in this house. It was only at the private eye's insistence that Constable Robeson insisted on the warrant's validity. It's not good till sunset, it's good till midnight. It's good for the day on which it's inscribed. But still, Joseph Johnson gave no more ground than he needed to. He did now allow, reluctantly, the constable and the family friend, Mr. Miller, to search the place for Sarah Hageman, but it was only on condition that no questions should be asked of any other black people they might discover inside the house. While the private eye remained at the front door, Constable Robeson and Mr. Miller now ventured upstairs to search with Joseph Johnson and his father-in-law, Jesse Cannon, attending them with cocked pistols in their hands. Can you imagine trying to search a house while someone has a gun right behind you? When Joseph Johnson unbolted the door leading to his second floor attic, Constable Robeson and Mr. Miller came face to face with five black women bound together by heavy chains. They sat in terrified silence round a cold fireplace. With Jesse Cannon's pistol still pressed at his back, Mr. Miller hastily inspected each of them, looking for Sarah Hageman's telltale scars. As he passed among them, each person's face became faintly illumined by a transient hope that she would be claimed, only to immediately relapse again into the settled features of despair as she saw him pass on without the ability to save her. 
None of these five women was Sarah Hagerman. They were all too old, all of them teenagers by Miller's reckoning. Sarah's 11. He and the others continued their house search for a few more minutes, but Sarah Hagerman was nowhere to be found inside. Joseph Johnson and Jesse Cannon seemed now to be enjoying watching this rescue mission fail in front of their eyes, and so they snidely insisted that their visitors could go ahead and search the outbuildings too. So they did. Inside one shack in the yard, Detective Willits found two black boys and three more black girls. None of them bore Sarah's marks. By then it was obvious they were not going to find her. Sarah's captors had evidently heard that this little posse was coming and had hustled her off the property before they'd arrived. Night was falling fast by now. With no hope of finding the girl now remaining, Detective Willits, Constable Robeson, and Mr. Miller soon had to give up and go home. In lantern light, they retreated to their horses as Johnson and Cannon jeered and hollered at them. Off you go. The next morning, Willits and Miller returned to Philadelphia, empty-handed. No one in Sarah Hagerman's family ever heard from her again. As a reminder, we know all of this because of a report the private eye, Willits, submitted two weeks later, along with his receipts, to his bosses at the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. That's the source I've been quoting on the screen these past few minutes. And as you've heard, it's sobering stuff. But of course, for an historian, it's also immensely revealing as well. But what does it reveal? That's what I'm hoping you will tell me? Who can tell me something they noticed from that attempted rescue of Sarah Hagerman that might shed light on how her kidnappers, the same gang that will kidnap Cornelius six years later, how this gang were able to operate successfully for so long? Who can tell me one detail they noticed in that little story which seems to shed light on how gangs like this or how this specific gang gets away with this stuff? Pick a detail. Tell me. The police had little authority in this rural area. Um, the constable in the story, Robeson, seems actually intimidated by the criminals um, uh, here. Um, the constable in the story may or may not be armed. We do not know because it's not mentioned in the letter. But you know who is armed and who's waving their weapons around? The criminals, right? So there's an imbalance of power there, not in the right direction for this story. Yeah, that's a great place to start. Another detail you notice that sheds any light on this. Go ahead. She pretended not to see what, what was happening. Citizens pretended not to see what was um, uh, happening here. Um, this gang shows no signs of being particularly secretive in their community, uh, right? They clearly have a mini campus uh, in which multiple people um, are members of the gang, work for Cannon and Johnson. They're moving people around publicly, visibly. They don't seem threatened or perturbed that any of their neighbors, at least, are going to do a damn thing about this, suggesting either that the neighbors are cool with this or that the neighbors are too, in, are too intimidated to, uh, do, to help law enforcement in any possible way. John? Maybe they benefited from looking into this actual, uh, two guys were doing, you know, it seems like they, the people in those two buildings, just, they were camelated and not even ventilating, but when they said no, uh, they can shift the difference and play it down, and so there's a benefit from possibly having knowledge and knowing that it's John says that maybe these local folks actually benefited from um, what these kidnappers were doing next door. There's at least two ways that could be possibly true. Uh, one is that they might be being paid off as informants, right? Oh, I saw someone on, on the road who looks like he could be a policeman. I better run and go and tell Jesse and Joseph, right? And they'll take a shilling or two in recompense. That's entirely plausible. 
we know from other kidnapping cases that that actually happens. This is not fantasy here. The second way a local community might see themselves as benefiting um, is, you know, these um, their white neighbors, whether they themselves own slaves or not, they're definitely in a in a time and a place where white supremacy is the governing ideology um, of their lives. And so the idea that their neighbors are taking free black people off the street and shipping them out of their region could be seen as their neighbors doing a public service. I know this seems abhorrent to us today, but if you read the Delaware newspapers from this period, as I have, you can find people saying this stuff loudly and proudly. I remember reading um, a, a Wilmington paper called The American Watchman from 1817, and there's a guy writing in to the newspaper uh, a letter to the editor, and he says, you know what, readers? I've noticed there's been a lot of kidnapping of free black people in and around our state in recent years years. You know what? If we could find these kidnappers who are spiriting away all these free black people from our state, you know what we should do with those kidnappers? We should give them a five-year tax break for the amazing service they're providing to all of us by ridding our community of this um, poor criminal um, element, the free black folks who live, live around them. So those attitudes are definitely there. Any other points we missed? Go ahead. Legal system was complicit broadly with uh, this underground railroad in that uh, convicted uh, by specious means, uh, African Americans were typically as as their uh, penalty sold out. Mm -hmm. Let me yeah, let me interpret that a particular way. Your comment about the legal system and the governing structures there. You notice how many, how many black people are in this story, right? It's not just Sarah Hagerman, who may or may not be seen, you know, being taken through the garden. There were, I don't know, 15, roughly, other um, black folks they found on this campus. Are they all victims of kidnapping by Cannon and Johnson? That's possible. This gang certainly functioned at that volume. But they could just as easily be legally enslaved uh, uh, people who are enslaved by the Cannons uh, and Johnsons, and the Cannon and Johnsons have the papers to prove it. That's what the legal system permits uh, in this period. And so you'll notice, uh, where has it gone? Uh, you'll notice that Johnson does something very clever uh, here, right? Uh, when he's setting the ground rules for the house search, he says, you can search for Sarah, you can look for her scars, but you cannot talk to anyone else you find. Now, they find roughly 15 other black folks there, and they none of them want to be there. They're all being held in some form of unfreedom or slavery there. But the warrant has Sarah's name on it. No one else's. They do not have the legal authority uh, to grab any pers black person they suspect of being kidnapped unless that person they suspect to be Sarah Hageman. And when you're going to rural Delaware or rural Maryland in the 1810s and 1820s, and you see black people in chains and unfree, the presumption is that they're legally enslaved. Because most black folks you'll find in that part of the world who are clearly unfree are not the victims of kidnapping from Philadelphia. They're actually people who've been you know, bought and sold for generations. So the legal system, the uh, political structures and governing structures, um, when coupled with this, Make sure that none of those others have a chance of freedom either. That's a great point. Was there someone over here? That is what I couldn't understand how the um, person being asked to have the, the home search could tell the police, you know, you, can, you can't talk to anyone else. Yes. How does he get away with this, uh, with this condition, right? Uh, two answers to that. Number one, believe it or not, that's how warrants worked back then, that it's for the person named and no one else, which is just different from how we do things um, today. But also, the guy setting that condition is the guy with the weapon. So the tendency is to listen to the guy with the gun, right? Thank you for that. Uh, last point. Go ahead. Or they'll come after us, and, and we'll be 
Right. If these white neighbors are not benefiting, just to pro- play devil's advocate here, if they're appalled by what their neighbors are doing, which is also a possibility, they're also terrified of who their neighbors are. Uh, are, and that buys their silence as well. This can cut any number of ways, and we do not know this stuff, but it all adds up uh, to this culture. So here's my own very quick summary of some of this letter's takeaways. You know, as you've just noticed, rather than record a daring and triumphant rescue of poor Sarah Hagerman, that letter instead offers rare first-hand testimony as to the limits of law enforcement's powers. It also shines a light upon the size of Jesse Cannon and Joseph Johnson's operations and upon the efficacy of the tactics they used to protect their black market business and preserve their own liberty. Despite his years of experience as a private investigator doing work like this, Willits struggles mightily to even gain the element of surprise in this story. He also struggled to secure a search warrant and to persuade a county constable to enforce that warrant. Evidently well-connected and much feared locally, the gang, Jesse Cannon and Joseph Johnson are the leaders, they beat him easily in this matchup. This is not even hard for them. Discovering Willett's report to his bosses was in many ways a godsend for me as an historian. It didn't feature Cornelius, and it took place, remember, in 1819. But it nonetheless provided a way to illuminate an otherwise shadowy part of the experience that Cornelius and the four other boys would have gone through when they arrived in that same safe house six years later as captives in 1825. And I mention this because I want you to understand why historians have so far written so very little about America's reverse underground railroad. It's not for lack of interest. The problem, of course, has been sources, documents. For instance, the oldest of the five boys that I write about in the book, a boy named Sam, he was only 15 when he vanished. The rest, like Cornelius, were much younger. One of the five was homeless while the other four came from families in different degrees of destitution. Most of them could not read or write. They were not the sort of people to leave behind many traces in libraries and archives. Of course, that's a big problem because this is a true story. And historians telling true stories need lots of sources to reconstruct past lives in ways that are true and fair. The stories and struggles of the many Americans who do not leave behind them rich troves of papers and diaries and letters often remain untold and unstudied as a result of the lack of readily available primary sources. You can't just make stuff up. So what do you do? All I can tell you is what I did as an historian when confronted with these problems. To reconstruct Cornelius' journey along America's reverse underground railroad, I began by wringing all that I could from a small packet of letters written to or from the mayor of Philadelphia, a man who belatedly wades into this story almost too late, like a second to midnight before it's too late. And I wrung whatever I could from coverage of Cornelius' case in a single anti-slavery magazine that covered it and gave a damn at the time. Though to be clear, historians have known about these modest sources, the mayor's letters and the magazine, for some time. But on their own, if that's all we had, these sources turn out to be too few and too thin to sustain a whole book-length reconstruction of this astonishing odyssey into and out of American slavery. So of course I had to keep going. I had to go looking elsewhere. I had to dig around in pretty much any archive I could think of looking for scraps of other information, new information that when woven together could help perhaps flesh this all out, fill in some of the gaps. That was really hard. Along the way, there was a lot of days spent finding absolutely nothing useful at all. I think the metaphor is, you know, looking for needles in haystacks, but finding only lots and lots of hay. 
Um, and if you've done your own historical or genealogical research, I'm sure you recognize some of those same frustrations. But ultimately, I think it was all worth it. Because over the six years of active research I did before I ever started writing this book, I unearthed dozens and dozens of needles buried in those haystacks. New sources about this case buried within 35 different archives in 14 different states in DC. The good news is I'm not gonna list all those hundreds of sources for you now, because times are moving, but um, I will quickly just highlight three of the discoveries I made ever so briefly to give you a sense. One thing I found was the handwritten notes of a trial that took place down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, a trial that would decide the fate of one of these boys the fate of Cornelius, actually, for the rest of his life. I also discovered something completely amazing and unexpected, something I never thought I would come across. I discovered a pair of letters authored by one of the kidnappers in which this kidnapper names his accomplices and describes their roles in this specific kidnapping case, an amazing find. I copied it into the back of the book in case you want to read it. Um, it's the sort of thing you could rightly accuse me of making up. It's so extraordinary, but trust me, I'd not make it up. I can show you where to find it. Um, most affectingly of all, at least for me, was something I found pretty quickly and pretty early on in a Philadelphia newspaper. Um, it was, of course, a missing persons notice um, paid for and written by Cornelius Sinclair's grieving father. It's really short, so I'm going to read it to you. It says, boy lost, the subscriber's son, Cornelius Sinclair, a colored boy about 11 years old, left his friends yesterday. As he had no cause and had never before absented himself, it's feared he's been seduced away by some evil-minded person. My son is a very dark-skinned, mixed-race lad. He's pretty stout built. He's got thin, long fingers. His eyes are weak. His left eye is smaller than his right. Any person hearing of our son will confer a favor on his afflicted parents by giving information to my employer at this address, Joseph Sinclair. I found this more than a decade ago. I've read this literally hundreds of times. And every single time I read this, uh, the two words that always jump out at me, like they're written in all caps or in neon on the side of the building, the words afflicted parents. All of us are children, parents. Many of us are parents of children or grandchildren. I have a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old in Hyattsville, Maryland, probably being put to bed by their mother after watching too much PBS Kids just now. <laughs> <laughs> the thought that my kids could be snatched away from my wife and I and that there'd be nothing meaningful I could do to get them back and see them safe. That just rips at me in the most primal human way. Afflicted parents. To me, that reads like the understatement of the 19th century. So we're getting on in time. And before I seek your questions, I want to wrap up now with a couple of very brief reflections about why I think learning about America's reverse underground railroad is important and why Cornelius Sinclair's particular experience as a rider on that railroad is worth your time. To begin with, I would argue forcefully that black lives have always mattered. And so any true story about free American children ripped from their American families and swallowed up by American slavery is a story worth reconstructing for its own damning sake. But the remarkable ordeal that Cornelius and his four fellow captives endured also demands our attention, I think, for many other reasons. For one thing, it serves as a pointed reminder 
that in the decades before the Civil War, child snatching was heartbreakingly frequent in uh, northern and mid-Atlantic towns and cities, and that black freedom everywhere in America was achingly fragile. It demonstrates, too, I think, the important role that this grotesque trade in kidnapped free people played in accelerating the spread of American slavery into the Deep South over this same period. Now, as I said, I'm not at liberty to spill all the beans about the book's astonishing second half, or I could literally be sued by Simon and Schuster, um, or tell you exactly what happened to Cornelius after he was kidnapped and trafficked into Alabama. But in case you don't read the book, I'm at least going to drop a few hints here. And I will say here that the dogged efforts of everyone involved in trying to save him and the four other boys from the horrors of slavery in the Southwest would have profound consequences. The rescue efforts of parents and allies and the aftermath of their campaign would radicalize black communities across the free soil states, inspiring African Americans to embrace bold new tactics in the cause of their own self-defense and mutual protection. And their efforts would reshape the rest of the American anti-slavery movement as well. Their efforts would encourage white abolitionists like the two white women who created this children's anti-slavery alphabet to focus the northern reading public's attention on the suffering of black families forcibly separated by kidnappers, by slave catchers, by slave traders, by slavery itself. But most immediately, outrage over the abduction of these five boys would force lawmakers in Pennsylvania to pass a tough new anti-kidnapping measure known as a personal liberty law. Their 1826 Pennsylvania personal liberty law would enrage Southerners and slaveholders and kidnappers more so than any other state law passed before the Civil War and would set in motion a chain of court challenges against it and political retaliations against it that culminated in the passage through Congress of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, a pro-slavery, pro-kidnapping abomination of a law that put this country on a collision course with civil war. So to conclude, Cornelius Sinclair's experience as a rider on America's reverse underground railroad was the result of the meeting of massive economic and political forces. And what happened to him? And the things that he and the other boys made happen next would as I've just suggested, usher in a new chapter in the history of slavery and freedom in the United States. But that lasting legacy should never be allowed to obscure the urgent stakes of this particular story. A 10-year-old boy and four other free children were dragged into slavery. They would have to fight like hell to try to escape. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, indeed, especially people online as well. Um, We're going to try, I think, to do a few uh, questions with uh, Nancy's uh, help, the most overqualified assistant in the world uh, uh, here. Uh, If you have a question, raise your hand. Nancy will come to you so you can speak into the mic so people back watching online uh, can hear you. Then I'll do my best to respond. And Mm -hmm. if there are questions or comments coming in online, uh, try and get uh, my my attention or Nancy's and we can uh, crack on. In fact, Catherine, do you have one already? Yes. So I Catherine do. Humphreys, our education coordinator, is is manning the uh, computer back there. Thank you so much, Catherine. Tell us who's got a question for us. 
So we have two questions from Marsha Greenberg. The first is, when there is no evidence, no data for historians, does that mean the history did not happen? How do we know and acknowledge history in the absence of proof? That's that, a, that's can a I great do one question. at a time or I'll forget the, second, the first one immediately? So let me respond to that one, then I'm happy to take the second one. Uh, it's a great question, right? Again, historians um, do not want to be pushed in a corner where they don't have sources and are forced to speculate. That is not a position that makes us comfortable. We do not think of ourselves as novelists. Uh, we think of ourselves as, for lack of a better comparison, documentarians, right? Um, so we build our interpretations of the past on sources, and we work incredibly hard to accumulate sources, to discover new sources, or to reinterpret existing sources in ways that help us answer our questions. And yet when you're dealing with enslavement, that can be particularly um, tricky because um, I hate to break it to anyone who doesn't know, but most enslaved people did not write accounts of their lives later on. We have roughly, I think, 600 um, first person accounts, you know, book length or otherwise, by survivors of slavery. Think of Frederick Douglass or someone um, like that. He actually wrote three of them. He couldn't stop. Um, uh, but that's a very small number compared to the many millions of, uh, of black Americans uh, who uh, endured slavery and sometimes uh, survived it. Many of those black Americans uh, were not uh, um, permitted to learn to read or write. So there are real limits in terms of the first hand sources from the people whose perspectives we often most want to reconstruct and recover. Whereas we often have a lot of documents created by uh, white enslavers, right? Because they were often pillars of their community. They often made a lot of money uh, from enslaving uh, black people. And that money brought them status and capital so that, you know, local historical societies would buy their diaries from them when they died, right? Their personal papers would end up in the Smithsonian or the National Archives, wherever else um, it might be. So there's a real power imbalance in the sources uh, there. And yet, if we want to tell stories that center the lives uh, of enslaved people and their struggles, um, we uh, have limited options. We can try to use, for instance, plantation records and read them against the grain, not with the perspective of the enslaver recording them, but with the perspective of the person whose life is being recorded um, you know, by some white man in accounting. Uh, house. And that's a technique historians have perfected over many, many years. The other thing we can do is try to be creative. If I, could t I won't give such long answers to all my questions, I promise. Um, it's okay. But if I can make one uh, uh, quick mention of something in the book, um, this, book has this book has 11 chapters. The two chapters I'm proudest of are the middle chapters, I think five and six, where I had the least to go on. And the intellectual challenge, the historical challenge was to tell a story that was true based on very, very thin slivers of sources. These two chapters are the chapters of the book where I narrate these five boys' journey from um, the Nanticoke River uh, down to Tuscaloosa, Alabama area. Uh, I wrote about 10,000 words, but um, it was based um, on very limited sources. Um, I'll tell you, don't tell anyone I told you this, but um, two of the five boys who survived this ordeal um, give testimony in court later on. And each boy's testimony is about 1,100 words long. So that's a total of about 2,200 words. Of those roughly 2,000 words, there's no more than 150 words between them about their journey from the Nanticoke down to Tuscaloosa. So I have about 150 words in the boys' own voices, mediated through someone else's fingers, um, about what that journey was like. Um, but I have to give readers about 10,000 words of um, detail about this journey to make sure you realize how important it was for these boys. I can't just devote 150 words and move on. So I had to be hugely, I think, you know, um, uh, creative or desperate uh, as I was trying to uh, uh, figure out how to, how to write that chapter. Um, I, so I, cho I, I drew on three other bodies of sources to help me do that. I'll just quickly name them. First of all, I drew on sources written by other um, black Americans who've made a very similar journey. Um, so um, there are some survivors of slavery who were 
um, either kidnapped and made a similar journey or who were legally traded from Maryland to Mississippi and who later survived and wrote their account. Josiah Henson from Maryland is a good example of one guy like that. Solomon Northup, his geography was very different. He went on a ship round Florida, but he writes about his psychological state as he gets further and further from home. And that insight, I think, transfers in some meaningful way to the psychology of these much younger boys making a land-based journey. So other survivors of slavery, their records. I also turned to um, the business records of legal slave traders who weren't involved in kidnapping, but were driving roughly a million people over five decades from places like Maryland to places like Mississippi. You can go to Duke University, to the Rubenstein Reading Room, and you can find boxes and boxes of their mail. You can read their mail as they're on these journeys and they're writing back to their loved ones. And to see what they're thinking about gave me some insight into what my captors were thinking about. And to see how they treated their own captives gave me some insight into that dynamic uh, as well. And then the third body of sources that I used um, was um, people who had nothing to do with American slavery, who were in the right place at the right time. So um, I wanted to know, as I was narrating these two chapters, um, what it's like uh, to walk through this geography uh, in that particular month, in that particular year. My two survivors don't tell me that information in more than a fracture. So I turned to hundreds of rich white European tourists who definitely didn't walk, but who were taking fancy stagecoaches and carriages from places like Washington down to places like New Orleans. And because they were tourists, they were writing down everything they did and everything they saw. And once they got back from their blowout American vacation back to London or Edinburgh, they'd publish in like two volume vanity books for three of their friends to read. Look what I did on my summer holidays. And these accounts are full of what the sun feels like in Alabama on a Thursday morning in November, what color the soil is when it rains in Tennessee. So that sort of color commentary was very useful to me because these boys were making the exact same journey. And every now and then, and I had no idea this would be true when I started reading their tourist accounts, every now and then these tourists in these fancy carriages on these roads, they'd actually encounter one of these walking overland coffles. Probably legally traded people, to be honest, but we can never be sure. But the point is they'd see chained groups of individuals, black men, women, and children filing past their fancy carriage windows. And they would write about what they saw. Some of them were outraged. Some of them were like, ah, it's America. Um, but they all described these people's physical demeanor as they filed past. And every one of these European tourists who wrote about the demeanor of the black coffles that walked past would reach for the same metaphor to describe how they looked. Every European tourist said, these black folks trudging towards New Orleans or Natchez, they all look like they're on their way to a funeral. And doesn't that just speak volumes about this? Long answer to a great question. I will be shorter from now on. Catherine? So her second question um, from Marcia is, what can we learn about the horrible history to help address the current kidnapping and trafficking of children for dangerous labor and uh, sex trafficking. Wow, she asks good questions, doesn't she? Um, I would say two things in response, and I will try to be brief. First of all, in general, the idea um, of facing up to our past, I'm an American citizen despite this silly accent, facing up to our past is something we have to take seriously or we'll never learn, we'll never make progress. We have to be willing to tell and to hear hard histories and hard truths. Otherwise, we just have our heads in the sand and our fingers in our ears. And that's not how real Americans should behave. Same is true for British people with their own legacies of racism and transatlantic slave trade, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm completely alive to Britain's history here as well. When it comes to modern day human trafficking, yes, I'm in line with Marsha here. I want people to realize that this historical story from 1825 has, shares a lot of common elements with the modern day human trafficking, which despite being entirely illegal, is a huge business around the world um, today. Slavery is only legal in one country today. I think it's Yemen. It's illegal everywhere else. And yet modern day slavery is bigger business than it ever was. There are vastly more people 
uh, who woke up today around the world in actual slavery than ever lived under pre-Civil War um, uh, race slavery. Modern day slavery looks different, of course, to historical race slavery. Um, the three big forms of modern day slavery, uh, agricultural slavery, um, the third party suppliers of coerced labor that pick much of our produce in Florida and California. So agricultural slavery, um, sex slavery, uh, those massage places on the side of strip malls where uh, the people um, from often from places like uh, Thailand um, have uh, had their passports confiscated and can't get out. Um, and of course, uh, domestic uh, slavery, which is particularly prevalent um, in um, uh, places like New York and Washington, where there are, and London too, where there are um, embassies and consuls, and some of those officers enjoy diplomatic immunity, uh, which means they can confiscate the passports of the black and brown people who cook their food and not give them back, and the police can't do a thing um, uh, about it. This is happening all over the world right now in 2023, not just America. The NGOs that try to track this stuff and draw attention to it say that around the world, somewhere between 20 and 40 million people woke up today in one of those three categories of modern day slavery, 20 to 40 million. And in the US, that number is not zero. In the US, the number is approximately 100,000 people woke up in one of those actual forms of slavery today, despite it being completely um, illegal. So I don't want ever to leave anyone with the sense that this is dead and gone in the same way that racism continues beyond the death of race slavery in 1865, uh, kidnapping and enslavement uh, has metastasized and taken on um, new forms. Marsha, excellent questions. Thank you so very much. Should we go to someone in the room next? Does anybody have a question? If you do, I will bring the microphone to you. I, I, let me come to you. I'm coming around. So everybody online wants to hear your wonderful question. I'll come back to you. Is there anything What interests uh, your work develop among other scholars and um, probably more important among news media following actual cases of slavery. Can you say that one more time? I didn't catch the thrust of it. Uh, what interest your research develop among scholars and other people that study these cases, mm -hmm. and what interest this develop on the news media like, I don't know, Fox, CNN, yeah. and other people? If that is the, if that is your work have that potential, I don't know. Yeah, thank thank you for that. So, um, you know, this book um, came out right before the pandemic. I was in the middle of an actual book tour when COVID said go home, immediately. Um, and so, you know, I want this book to get as much attention as it can because I do think uh, its themes resonate with um, uh, today. I will tell you that uh, this book has had a wonderful uh, reception from many. Um, audiences in many different places, um, but uh, I have yet to be invited to give a book talk uh, anywhere south of uh, North Carolina um, so far, um, which given that a good chunk of this story takes place in Alabama and Mississippi is actually pretty astonishing uh, in terms of geography, right? Uh, so you can fill in the gaps as to why that uh, uh, might be. I'm not actually looking to, to go on Tucker Carlson. I don't think that would be a good use of um, uh, my, my time. Um, but I, I, I do agree that um, this is a story that, for better or worse, complicates some cheap binaries that we continue to wrestle with as Americans looking at American history. Um, the biggest one, I think, which emerges from the era of the Civil War is the idea that the South is evil and therefore the North is good. Because that's the dynamic of the Union versus the Confederacy, at least when we think about it now, right? It's certainly how Northerners thought of themselves during the Civil War. Um, coming down to our... Yes, so I would say that this story undercuts that binary in, in certain ways, uh, in a couple of ways. 
One is that um, the kidnapping is taking place on the streets of one of the North, North's largest, most cosmopolitan, most proud of itself, free soil cities, and no white person there, save a few, is doing a good damn thing um, to stop it, which is a reminder to us as people looking back at the past that even though uh, slavery was dead in northern states like Pennsylvania and New York by the 1820s, racism certainly wasn't dead and buried, right? And it's the persistence of racism and white supremacy that allows these kids to be kidnapped off the streets and no white bystander to ever bat an eye. So that's an important sort of challenge to simple binaries. If you get deep into the book, in the second half, you'll also find that there are actually some white southerners who behave as allies to some of these boys in ways that confound your expectations of how white slave-owning or slavery-adjacent Southerners should behave. That's not to in any way apologize for our Southern slavery, but it's to say that things are always more complicated than they first appear. And I just think fundamentally what any historian can bring to any national conversation today is not just perspective, but complexity, right? The idea that we can function just with the most simple stories we're always going to be let down by the simplicity of those stories. There's someone over here, I think. Michelle, was it you had the question? I'm on my way right now. Just give me one second. Okay, so I have a comment and a question. So you challenged us during the presentation to, uh, to look at the situation that happened um, at the compound, if you will. And I think people said things like, you know, uh, I guess folks had were complicit, if you will, mm -hmm. possibly neighbors were complicit. And so then it immediately challenged me, as well as hopefully everyone in here, what are those key issues right now that we're complicit in, right? Uh, we clearly see a pattern of books like yours being disallowed, made illegal, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, in certain places in this United States. Yeah. And certain people are certainly on the um, on the forefront, you know, trying to fight it. But a lot of us are just like, oh, that's those states. Mm -hmm. That's that governor. So, again, it, it challenged me. But my question was, in terms of that term reverse underground railroad, mm -hmm. is that a term that you coined? Is it commonly accepted in history? I'm not going to lie. I have a visceral reaction to it because it reminds me of when people say reverse discrimination. Right. Reverse so racism, so right, right. is that a term that's now accepted for that particular? Yep. Uh, yeah. What a, what a, first of all, thank you for the great comment and great uh, question, Michelle. Um, in, in response to the comment, I, I'm hoping we're all on the same page here. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm right. The book banning is never a good look. Um, that societies that permit and encourage book banning are really condemning themselves to thriving on ignorance, I think, going um, uh, forward. And the free exchange of ideas and different points of view and perspective is with a sign of any healthy, I think, um, uh, society uh, here, and especially when it comes to libraries. Uh, have you ever been to a library, walked in, and the librarian says, here you go, these are the books I've chosen for you, you must now go and read them, and forced you to read them and then tested you whether you read them or not. That's not actually how libraries operate. Uh, libraries are places where you get to go and choose what books you would like um, uh, to read. So the idea that there are library districts, library counties around this nation where that selection is being made for you before you even walk in, I find that particularly um, troubling. And don't get me started on an educational policy uh, here. But what I will just say is if you are unhappy with the direction of educational policy in your community, you have levers. One lever uh, is it, you often get to vote on school board elections from different county to different country. Uh, you can sometimes donate to candidates you'd like to see stay in these races and thrive. And if you don't like the candidates for school board, consider running yourself, because if you don't, who else is going to do that? Uh, I've got to say um, that every time I hear myself say that, I think I should probably take my own advice one of these um, days. So I hope I'm with you on that. Um, and uh, the, the question, Michelle, was about the term, uh, America's reverse underground railroad. Um, cards on the table here. I'm not the person that came up with that. Um, if you 
Google that phrase. With any luck, you'll get some hits to my book. But you'll also get a Wikipedia page, which says, which says Reverse Underground Railroad. And you'll see that page has been in existence far longer than my book has and cites usages of that term that predate my work and my scholarship. That's probably where I stumbled across this term, to be quite uh, honest. And it's one of several terms or names for this complex phenomenon that different people have bandied about in recent years. Reverse Underground Railroad seems to come largely from folklore scholars, by the way. Um, and there are other terms like the other Underground Railroad or the kidnapping of free black Americans. Um, I would say that I had to make a choice about what I was going to call this complex phenomenon in this book aimed at general readers. I don't think the reverse underground railroad is a perfect term um, because it can conjure, you know, ideologically charged terms like reverse racism, etc. But also because it implies that the underground railroad and this kidnapping phenomenon are directly uh, equivalent. And even though I drew your attention to some similarities, I could just as easily have drawn your attention to some dissimilarities uh, between it. So no, so that name is not perfect. I'm happy to concede that to anyone. But if it's a term that people encounter in this book and say, hold on a minute, I'm having a reaction to this term, either positive because you love it or negative because you hate it, then it served its purpose. Uh, in that way, in making you think about what on earth the nature of the comparison is between this kidnapping phenomenon and the heroic underground railroad, which seems like so far removed um, from it. I want to, I've chosen to embrace that term because I think it gets readers to consider the possibility that the scale of kidnapping was broadly equivalent to the scale of the underground Railroad. By comparing these two things, I'm suggesting similarities of magnitude as well as um, uh, other similarities. And one of the great ins one of the, what I hope is one of the great insights of my book is that kidnapping was not infrequent or rare. That black Americans by the tens of thousands uh, were kidnapped uh, from freedom uh, into uh, enslavement, uh, almost to the degree that every person who made it out is being replaced by someone sucked in. I think that's uh, an astonishing thing to say about American history. I think it's something that most people haven't heard. And if this term helps jolt people uh, to consider uh, what's at stake here, then it's worth any problems I think it, it causes. Thanks for the question. Um, I think we have time. Catherine, did you have another one online? We have one online, but Pete's also had his hand up. Yeah. Pete, I am walking back to you right now. I couldn't see you because of the poll. Very interesting talk. Thank you for that. Uh, is there any evidence uh, that you're aware of of the legal interstate slave trade trying to fight their competitors, this illegal kidnapping? Yeah, what a great question. I hope everyone heard that. So I've got these two different phenomena, which, if you squint, seem identical. One is the legal domestic slave trade, planters in places like Maryland selling some of their surplus captive laborers to long distance traders, reselling them in Mississippi, entirely legal, big business, a million sales. And I've also got this entirely illegal kidnapping business of kidnappers like Cannon and Johnson kidnapping free black people wherever they find them, doesn't matter where slavery is legal or illegal, any free black person they grab and they traffic, they launder into that uh, system. Um, two things to say about the reaction of legal slave traders uh, to it. One is that many of them were quite happy to do business when it suited them with illegal suppliers, kidnappers, right? Kidnappers didn't always personally march their captives to the south to resell them. Kidnappers were just as happy if they could sell uh, the person they kidnapped to a legal slave trader who was carrying taking 35 people that way anyway, and uh, who was willing to uh, buy these kidnapped people and launder them into their supply chain if the price was right. We know this happens over and over again. If you read Solomon Northup's 12 Years a Slave, that's exactly what happens uh, to him. The slave trader who carries him from Washington on a ship to New Orleans is in many ways an above board legal 
trader, but he had a side business in buying victims of kidnapping and laundering them through his uh, business. In the movie, he's played by Paul Giamatti, uh, by the way, who's very oily in the role, as you can probably uh, imagine. So in practice, there was a lot of uh, synergy, we might say, between legal traders and kidnappers. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Publicly, however, legal traders are horrified that kidnappers are out there besmirching the good name of legal slave traders by kidnapping black Americans and then selling them in the same uh, market. And the largest of the legal slave traders, firms like Franklin and Armfield, which is based in Alexandria, uh, Virginia, and whose slave pen you can still visit at Freedom House uh, on Duke Street, uh, you know, they uh, did, you know, effectively ran PR campaigns saying, we're nothing like those kidnappers you've heard of. We're the good guys in this story. We're just filling a function, meet, helping supply, meet demand. We're just agents of capitalism. We're uh, titans of industry. We're not those vicious criminals, even though behind the scenes they were often shaking hands. Great question. Thank you. And I know we're over time, but we're going to take one more. Catherine, you have another question from, from online. Michael asked the question, what do you see or hope is the fruit of this story for 2023? So I won't repeat the answer I gave uh, earlier on in response to the gentleman uh, uh, over there. Um, except to say that it's hard to hear stories like this. We all want to hear happy, romantic, happy ending Disney versions of history, but the Disney version of history usually bears only the loosest approximation um, to the truth here. And I want to use truth with a capital T here because um, there have been truth and reconciliation efforts in many parts of the world following historical atrocities at great scale like genocide and apartheid or domestic terrorism in Northern Ireland. There have been useful, fruitful truth and reconciliation processes in Northern Ireland, uh, in South Africa, um, in other parts of the world, even within the United States on local scales like in Greensboro, North Carolina, um, uh, for instance, Tulsa, Tulsa's trying to get one up and running uh, over the 1921 uh, Tulsa uh, um, uh, events there, uh, race massacre. So I think that's an emerging model that could be applied to how we think about American uh, enslavement and its legacies um, uh, today. We're edging, I think, closer to be willing to talk about reparative, restorative justice uh, as a nation, it's not going to be an easy conversation to talk about what some people call reparations, what I call restorative um, uh, justice. But I think, you know, many scholars and many activists and many descendant communities uh, would argue that there's more harm to be done by not engaging in some of that um, work here. So any piece of scholarship that can help people today better understand uh, the world that we've all inherited and the legacies and aftermath and lingering after effects of enslavement and the continuing power of racism and white supremacy. I think that's useful work that I'm happy to be a part of. And uh, this is what subtly does, I think, really um, well in a welcoming, inclusive way that brings all of us along and makes all of us uh, uh, smarter. I hope that history doesn't have to be uh, polarizing. Um, and I hope this book is a way to uh, bring people along on a journey of uh, truth, which may get us closer a little bit to some form of um, reckoning and uh, reconciliation. Uh, thank you very much for the question. <laughs> Well, we knew you were going to be fabulous, and you were. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for finally making it down here to see us. This was an incredible evening. I am so glad for all of you who joined us online. We have many descendants, I think, who have joined us online tonight as well, Sauterly descendants. Speaking of coming together, our Day of Unity and Healing is going to be coming up next month. It is going to be on August 19th. It will start at 10 o'clock in the morning.
Um, Kim, I believe we have Eventbrite up already, so we can already still start signing up and let us know that you're coming. It will be a day to come together. It is close to the day, UNESCO Day of Remembrance of the first African Americans coming to this nation to be enslaved. We will remember those who were lost in the Middle Passage coming here, but we will also be looking toward the future. It's the, it is beyond, uh, the title of this year's Day of Unity and Healing is Beyond Color, The Power of Connection, and I really hope that you can join us for that. Thank you again so much, Richard. You see, if you didn't buy a, a copy tonight, for those who are online, you can still get a signed copy. We are also, also going to have some in our museum store. This is a kind of event we love happy, having, and we are so glad to share it with all of you. Thank you for being part of it tonight. Take care. Thank you.